everybody and welcome to Rule Breaker. Today we're going to take a look at the Twilight Codex for Twilight Imperium 4th Edition. And um, we're going to be focusing on Volume 1, which is called Ordinian. Now, as this is a print and play expansion and update for the game, uh, I don't have it printed out. I've got it on screen here. So we'll be going through the file directly and talking about some of the stuff that you can expect to play if you go and print out the cards and take the rules and stuff into the game. So without further ado, let's just click down through the pages. Uh, there's an introduction here and uh, some pretty art, of course. Um, there's a forward from the developer that we're going to skip over for the moment. You can read that in your own time. Um, and there's also some really nice fiction here called Flight by Calvin Wonsei Loon, uh, which is a few pages long. and uh, worth reading for a bit of flavor so you can also do that in your own time and the first section of this codex the omega initiative this is kind of a hey we've tweaked things that were um, different in the past like omega technologies as you can see here uh, and this first page here that focuses on the technologies there's three faction techs that got an omega version and two basics um, I'll just zoom in a little here so we can read these more clearly. Um, we'll talk about the faction ones first. So the Ghost of Creus, their uh, wormhole generator has been upgraded to an Omega version that has the action exhaust this card to place or move a Creus wormhole token into either a system that contains a planet you control or a non-home system that does not contain another player's ships. So this is only a very slight change to the standard wormhole generator. Uh, the difference being here that they've made it an action where you exhaust the card, whereas previously you were tied into doing it at the start of the status phase and you had to do it only at that one particular point of time in the game round. So a little bit more flexibility for the Creus player uh, to control when they want to do that move and also a slowly, slight little bit of stall and um, for them to do if they want to wait around to do something else. So um, a small but significant update to their technology. Uh, we scroll down here. The next one is the Yin Spinner Omega, which reads, after you produce units, place up to two infantry from your reinforcements on any planet you control or in any space area that contains one or more of your ships. Um, the original Yin Spinner uh, is a little different. It reads, after one or more of your units use production, place one infantry from your reinforcements on a planet you control in that system. Uh, so slightly different. It's a unit doing production, so there's more flexibility with the Omega one. And it's one infantry instead of two. Uh, and the other difference there is also uh, the Omega version allows you to put them onto a ship that's in a space area, which you couldn't do before, giving the Yin... A bit of a boost, um, much needed boost for their uh, racial tech. Next we have the Midas Reactor Omega, the Embers and Muats faction technology, um, which reads your ships can move into supernovas. Each supernova that contains one or more of your units gains the production five ability as if it were one of your units. Um, so this is probably the biggest over the others. Um, that we've seen in this codex for the racial technologies. Uh, the original Magmus reactor reads after uh, your ships can move into supernovas, same. Uh, but then the difference is after one or more of your units use production in a system that either contains a war sun or is adjacent to a supernova, gain a trade good. So you're just getting a trade good there rather than being able to produce inside a supernova. Mr. Omega gives you the opportunity to build in a hex that nobody else can get into and then you know move out of there at your own pace and uh, i think it's much better than the original one and gave the the embers a much needed bump in quality when that was added into this codex so really really good balancing mechanism in the codex there's also the two basic technologies that are a slight difference um as well there's the uh, megan defense grid omega and the x89 bacterial weapon omega so the mega defense grid omega reads at the start of ground combat on a planet that contains one or more of your structures, you may produce one hit and assign it to one of your opponent's ground forces. Yeah, so the original Megan Defense Grid read, you may exhaust this card at the start of a round of com ground combat on a planet you that contains one or more of your units that have planetary shield. 
your opponent cannot make combat rolls during this combat round. So, yeah, the, the Omega one allows you to produce a hit straight away. As long as you have a structure, that's nice. It's something predictable. It's a good defensive move. Uh, the original one was just about dice rolling, really. It was stopping your opponent from making combat rolls in the, in one round. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like the original one was not great. It was highly luck-based. This one at least gives you something desirable, a reason to actually go for it. So I think this is also an improvement. Um, still not the most exciting tech in the world, but but better, definitely. Um, the other basic tech that got the, the upgrade is um, the X89 bacterial weapon. So the Omega version is after one or more of your units use bombardment against the planet, if at least one of your opponent's infantry was destroyed, you may destroy all of your opponent's infantry on that planet. So now you can actually kill that enormous pillar of infantry tokens that are on planets that people have been hoarding for ages and ages and ages. It's expensive. You've got to get your three um, green pre-rec technology things down before you can get it but the big benefit over the, the omega version and the reason why it's actually useful now is that um it, it's just so much better than the original the original one which reads action so the, that's the main key difference here is that it's an action you've got to do it and you can't do it on the same round as your bombardment and um, the action is exhaust this card and choose one planet in a system that contains one or more of your ships that have bombardment destroy all infantry on that planet so what What's happening in my games, at least, was um, someone was going in to a system. They were attacking the ships, breaking down the ships, getting into ground combat, um, trying to win that ground combat against an enormous fleet was all, or enormous pile of infantry was always really really hard. Then they'd have to wait till the next turn to do the action, to do the bacterial weapon, to bombard, to, to kill all those infantry, and typically. What was happening was the other player was able to reinforce that system and that, that player wasn't able to do anything there again because they already had a, a, a token in that system and couldn't activate it again. The Omega version is really good compared to the original. It means it actually does what it's supposed to do. You don't have to do another action. It happens right away as long as you kill one of the infantry. Um, so you got to have at least one hit. So you need a few troops maybe to go down and at least try and get one hit. Um, but once you do... At least it's actually going to do what it's supposed to do. So this is probably, along with the Embers racial tech, this is probably the biggest improvement in the Codex. Uh, we're going to move on to Promissory Note updates. So there was five Promissory Note updates in Omega the, in the Omega initiative for Codex 1. Um, so let's take a look at them individually. So the one is this one here, the War Funding Omega for the Barony of Letnev. Um, it reads, after you and your opponent roll dice during space combat, you may re-roll all of your opponent's dice. You may re-roll any number of your dice, then return this card to the let net player. And the difference there is, in the previous version, it used to read, the let net player loses two trade goods. So, like, the let net player didn't want to lose those two trade goods, so they weren't going to give away their war funding. Uh basically never happened so that doesn't happen anymore now there's no downside for the let net player and uh, they can just hand this off nothing bad happens and um, the person with it can reroll any of uh, their opponent's dice or any of their own dice and then the card goes back it can be used against the let net player sure but the let net player doesn't lose two trade goods it's a it's a much better trade-off so i think the omega uh, promissory note for them will actually be used whereas the other one it only be used in extreme circumstances, really. Um, second appearance of the Yin Brotherhood in Codex 1 is their promissory note, the Greyfire Mutagen Omega, which reads, At the start of a ground combat against two or more ground forces that are not controlled by the Yin player, replace one of your opponent's infantry with one infantry from your reinforcements, then return this card to the Yin, pl uh, yin player. Basically doing the Yin's indoctrination ability, I so to say. And... Comparing that then to the original Greyfire Mutagen, um, again, this one was really, really bad for the Yin player themselves. The Yin player cannot use faction abilities or faction technology during this tactical action. So if you handed this off as the Yin player, somebody could effectively just say, hey, you can't do anything for this whole round. 
and um, you were yeah you were in trouble. You would be able to do your faction abilities. You wouldn't be able to use your faction technology. Still be able to do stuff. Still be able to move around. Still be able to get involved in action cards, all that sort of thing. But the Yin really do rely on their faction abilities, and faction technology. So having this completely out of the game and exchanged with a version of indoctrination, um, just made it more viable. You, know, you were much more likely, much more likely to uh, pass out this promissory note than you were before. That's a bit of fun. You can not directly hurt yourself, and you can give somebody a buff. It's nice. Um, next up is the Arborek. Their promissory note Omega Stymie Omega is after another player moves ships into a system that contains one or more of your units. You may place one command token from that player's reinforcements in any non-home system, then return this card to the Arborek player. So this is like a way of, of you saying, hey, um, if someone attacks me in one of my systems, I can take one of their tokens and put it anywhere I want so they can't go there in future turns. Really like that one. It's cool. Um, of course, it can affect the Arborek player themselves, but... I mean, if you're handing out promise, you know, like this, you probably aren't intending to attack that player in the first place. Alternatively, it's a really good way to make someone think you're not going to do that when you really, really are. Uh, so there's a lot of intrigue and backstabbery possible here because of Stymie Omega. And likewise, comparing that to the original one, which was an action uh, that read, place this card face up in your play area. While this card is in your play area, the our brick player cannot produce units in or adjacent to non-home systems that contain one or more of your units. If you activate a system that contains one or more of the Arborex player's units, return this card to the Arborex player. So this was really, really bad for the Arborex player. The player holding this had all the control. They, they could choose to never activate a system containing Arborex player units for the whole game. They could put a wall around them and they could stop them from, from producing stuff, uh, which was really, really, really powerful. Uh, it was crazy to ever give this out as the Arborek player. So another win for the Codex here. Something that sees sense uh, by changing that up completely. So a uh, much needed upgrade. All right, we'll scroll down here. We have one for the Winu, which is Acquiescence Omega, which reads, when the Winu player resolves a strategic action, you do not have to spend or place a command token to resolve the secondary ability of that strategy card, then return this card to the Winu player. And then compared to the original, which read at the end of the strategy phase, exchange one of your strategy cards with the strategy card that was chosen by the winning player, then return this card to the winning player. I mean, you're never going to give that out because you're giving somebody all the control, especially towards the end of the game when you want to score that point to tip you to the 10 or the 14 to win the game. Um, or if you want the initiative, or if you want the technology, or if you want the imperial... Um, yeah, you, you you don't want someone else to have control over your strategy card. It was one of the worst things in the game was this original acquiescence promise we know, and it's been changed uh, dramatically for the better here with the Omega version, uh, giving the winning no game losing potentially uh, ability to somebody else, um, and allowing that other player to do more secondaries if they're low on tokens. So it's a win win and a good one to trade. So. Really, really massive improvement for that promissory note. Um, and then the last one, Cybernetic Enhancements Omega for the L1Z1X MindNet, which reads, when you gain command tokens during the status phase, gain one additional command token and then return this to the Lizix player. Very simple. Someone's getting an extra token. They want that. It's desirable. You could probably trade this for something nice uh, as the Lizix player people will will be happy to, to deal with you, which is not typical for the, the the crazy dreadnought guys. And then directly comparing that one to the original one, um, the player is still getting their token, um, but the difference here is that the Lizix player is not losing one. So we'll just read it out. It's the start of your turn. Remove one token from the Lizix player's strategy pool and return it to his reinforcements. Then place one command token from your reinforcements into your strategy pool and return the card to the Lizix player. So the Lizix player didn't want to be losing a token um, from strategy at any time, really. I mean, it's not desirable at all to have to have an extra one in there in case this would happen. Or if you had only the one there having it taken away, that would have been awful. So this was not one that you really want to be passing around. Now the Omega version is just beneficial for the other player without having a hindrance on the, the Lizix player themselves. So it's something that you can wheel and deal with 
meaning that it's a lot more viable and a lot more useful. So all around much improved stuff for promissory notes as well. And that's the promissory notes. There's five of them there. Um, the rest of the codex is a bit different. Um, we'll talk about this stuff um, in a bit more detail. Um, first up, there's some action cards. There's the Ixthian artifacts, uh, which is basically just a fancy way of saying new stuff. Stuff that's not a tweak of something that came before, but rather something new. Um, you can add these into the game. You can add them in with or without the Prophecy of Kings from the looks of things. Um, so let's have a look at these a little bit. We'll just read them through very quickly. Uh, so the first one is insider information. After an agenda is revealed, look at the top card of the agenda deck. So you'll be looking at the next one. That's cool. That's that's handy. It uh, gives you the opportunity to think about what you're going to vote for, whether you want to use your votes in the first agenda or if you want to save them for the second. Likewise with riders, if you've got them in your hand, it gives you a bit more information to figure out what you're going to do with them. The next one's plagiarize action, spend five influence and choose a non-faction technology owned by one of your neighbors, gain that technology. Uh, five influence, you can spend that with planets. So, you know, it's not like you're throwing something away forever. Um, it is a lot of influence, but gaining technology is great. You just gain it. You don't have to actually pay for it on top. So that's, that's awesome. Next one is master plan. After you perform an action, you may perform an additional action this turn. I really like that one. Double up, do two things. Great. Uh, rally after you activate a system that contains another player's ships. Place two command tokens from your reinforcements in your fleet pool. So there you go. Two tokens for an action card. I know they're going straight into fleet pool, but you can shift them around at the end of the turn. Really, really like that one. Super handy. Maybe a little OP even in, in some respects. Um, the next one, scramble frequency. Um, after another player makes a bombardment, space cannon or anti-fighter barrage roll, they need to re-roll all the dice. Okay, so if they get a really lucky roll, you can just say nope. And forward supply base, after another player activates a system that contains your goods, contains your units, gain three trade goods, then choose another player to gain a trade good. All right, so free stuff for everybody. Uh, the last line of this page is fighter conscription. Action, place a fighter from your reinforcements in each system that contains one or more of your space docks or units that have capacity. They cannot be placed in systems that contain other players' ships. Um, so you, if you've got three space docks, that's three fighters. If you've got units that have capacity, they're also getting a fighter. So that could be your flagship, that can be dreadnoughts, it can be cruisers, um, it can be carriers, obviously. Um, so it could be a lot of fighters if you, if you plan it well. So also a very very strong card um blitz here at the start of an invasion each of your non-fighter ships in the active system that do not have bombardment gain bombardment six until the end of the invasion i believe that stacks with other things that require bombardment so that that is also really cool like that'll do stuff for other cards more combos um so again really really strong i feel like these cards are all really good um harness energy after you activate an anomaly replenish your commodities so an anomaly is any of the hexes that have the red uh sort of frame border around the the perimeter of the the hex um there's a few of those there's nebulas there's gravity rifts um, asteroid fields that sort of stuff and um, refreshing replenishing your commodities if you're not really getting something so to speak you're not getting trade goods that you can use straight away but you are setting yourself up to be able to do that in the next round and the last one on that page is hack election after an agenda is revealed during this agenda voting begins with the player to the right of the speaker and continues counterclockwise so that's a bit of a weird one i mean sure just vote the other way around it's not a massive deal really it's much less powerful than some of the other ones we've seen in my opinion that's the first page of action cards there's a second page um which is just here it looks like a placebo album cover i just thought i'd call that out i always think of that when i see that image um so these action cards, just more uh, more into the pile. You should probably add these with these. I'm not sure how balanced this is, but this is what comes together in this pack. So you should probably do them together. Uh, so let's look at these in a bit more detail as well. Okay, so the first one, reflective shielding. When one of your ships uses sustained damage during combat, produce two hits against your opponent's ships in the active system. So that's like, wow, really powerful. Keep that for when you've got a bunch of dreadnoughts. Uh, to fly around with and 
yeah, you're just gonna just gonna carve some stuff up when you get into a particular fight. Uh, impersonation, action, spent tree, influence to draw a secret objective. I love this card. This is so good. This is like um, spending influence to get an extra objective is just such a nice thematic thing. I think that's really, really nice. Um, and then a way to get points, possibly points very quickly as well. So that's great. Really like that action card. Uh, solar Flare, after you activate a system during this movement, other players cannot use space cannon against your ships. Really nice uh, combat for things that have PDS2 or if you're going in to fight the turtles. And sanction after an agenda is revealed, you cannot vote on this agenda. Predict allowed an outcome of this agenda. If your prediction is correct, each player that voted for that outcome returns one command token from their fleet supply to their reinforcements. So it's kind of like a everybody hates this rider. A rider to get rid of people's command tokens from fleet supply. Well, that's it's annoying. It's an annoying card. I would not want someone to play that against me. Um, Counterstroke. After a player activates a system that contains one of your command tokens, return that command token to your token to your tactic pool. Okay, so that means you get the token back and can reuse any units in that system or attack it again if you didn't have anybody left there. So that's kind of good. Yeah, I like that one. And Ghost Squad. After a player commits units to land on a planet you control. Move any number of ground forces from any planet you control in the active system to any other planet you control in the active system. So again, you're restricted to systems that have multiple planets. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it allows you to stack the deck a bit in, in a case of players trying to attack a weaker planet first to get points or to get, I don't know, take a planet, a particular planet that, that you might want to keep. Um, it's a bit edge casey. It's... Yeah, it's all right. And then the last line of action cards in this thing is four of the same one, War Machine. So um, they're all the same. They read, when one or more of your units use production, apply plus four to the total production value of your units and reduce the combined cost of the units by one. So you're building a lot of stuff and you're getting a small discount. So that's really good. There's four of those in the deck. Um, so I guess they kind of want that one to be the main card in the in the pile that gets added in. Encourage a bit of um, additional combat stuff. That's the action cards from the Ixtine Artifact section. Um, the rest of the codex is kind of scenario stuff. Um, I'm not really interested in that myself. I'll just quickly look at it with you um, so you can kind of get an idea of what it is. Um, when I play Twilight Imperium, I play it the way it's meant to be played, where you pick a faction, it's generate the galaxy together. Um, at least that's my opinion. You may have a different opinion. Um, if you're interested in these scenarios, give them a shot. And if anybody out there has played, for example, Ordinian here, um, and would like to comment on it, um, please do so and tell me how it was, because I'd love to know. Um, I just really love the base game so much that whenever I get people together to play it, because it is such a a big game that takes quite a long time and requires a lot of organization i don't want to do one of these i want to do something with a bit of mystery and a bit of excitement in it um so this ordinian setup specifically calls out that you play as the arborek the ghost of Creus, the necrovirus the embers of muat the lizix and the barony of letnev and you've got these um redacted cards that come in that do different things um, the rules are all here. Again, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I'm not crazy interested in it myself, but let me know if you uh, have had good experiences with it. Uh, and then there's this other one, the Nexus. So this is a six-player preset um, where it's got just a particular layout of the galaxy. I'm not really sure what's going on here with this one. It just looks like a preset universe to me i'm noticing that there's a lot of empty spaces around this starting system for some reason which is weird uh yeah i don't know like you guys tell me if, if you've tried it let me know if it was any good it doesn't look balanced to me just from a top down quick high level look at it um but there you go that's the thing um the other thing in here is the rules update section um so the Diplomacy 2 was changed in Codex 1. This is the same one as in the Prophecy of Kings um, expansion. So if you've got Prophecy of Kings, that's what this is. Um, for more details on that, check out the videos on Prophecy of Kings. Um, 
They've also included hypermetabolism, the correct version of the hypermetabolism card. Uh, the original printing had a typo where it said gain two command tokens instead of one, but you always get two. So the, the tech is actually to gain three instead of two. And they've just corrected that there and they've added it into the into the file. Um, they've also called out something to do with grabby riffs. And actually, I really wanted to highlight this one because it came up as a comment in one of the videos recently. And I couldn't find the answer. Well, here it is. Um, and it reads, to avoid a number of unusual mechanical interactions, the timing and exact effect of gravity rifts has been adjusted. Now units will roll for the gravity rift as they pass through it rather than in the destination system, and units that fail to survive the roll are removed from the board and returned to players' reinforcements rather than being destroyed, meaning that abilities that trigger when a unit is destroyed are not resolved. So this directly affects the Yin flagship, um, which people were asking me if they fly the flagship through gravity rift and it gets to its destination but explodes does it kill everything in the system so if we're playing with codex one rules which i assume you should at this stage um, it means that that doesn't happen so there's the answer to that question um and then retreating with infantry there's a, a change there they basically just clarified the fact that you can take units from planets with you when you retreat that's what this whole paragraph is uh you can read it yourself and get the full gist of it, but that's basically the, the point of it. Um, and then rerolls during combat. Abilities that reroll or modify dice during combat no longer need to be used immediately following a single die roll. Instead, a player can roll dice for all of their units in the combat before deciding which, if any, to reroll. So essentially, you just roll all of your dice and you can decide to reroll at the end of that. And that's it for the codex. There's an ad um, for Prophecy of Kings and for the Fractured Void novel by Tim Pratt. I haven't read it, don't know if it's any good. If anybody has, again, in the comments, let me know. Um, and then just a nice pretty background uh, to cover the back of it if you do print it out. So there you go, that's Codex 1. Um, so thoughts overall, great idea. Love that it's free. Um, I also don't love that it's free because it means you have to go print it out for yourself. And I know a lot of players won't do that. Um, there are ways to get pre-made uh, copies of this. Um, I found a good one on Etsy. Um, if you look around, I'm sure you'll you'll find stuff yourself. I show those off in the different race videos. You'll see the quality there. The second thing I just want to show you before the end is there's the, the file that you do get um, on the website that has all the cards is formatted directly for a printer. This is it here. I'm just going to turn it around so you can see it better. Um, if you give this to a professional printer, they'll They'll print it out for you and um, they'll do a good job if they know what they're doing. So you also have that option. Shouldn't be expensive. Um, there it is. Also, it's a nice resource for anybody who wants to homebrew their own cards. So you've got that too. Um, so highly recommend you check out Codex 1. It does bring a little bit of better balance into the game pre-Prophecy of Kings. And it does help with Prophecy of Kings as well. So yeah, give it a look. Twilight Codex. This has been Real Breaker. It's been nice chatting to you all. And I'll see you again soon. Bye now.